everybody! Welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Dana Trupiana, and I cover infamous gangsters every week in a true crime-like format. My show, Mob Times, comes out every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, most of the time. Well, it's Tuesday, it's 5 p.m., so here I am. If you're new here, welcome. If you've been here before, I hope you already know how much I love each and every one of you. And thank you guys so much for all your love and support. Today, I am going to do my absolute best to finish up Meyer Lansky and get him wrapped up in only two episodes. As opposed to Carmine Persigo, who went four freaking episodes. So we're not going to go through any life updates or anything. We're just going to jump right in. So let's go ahead and do that, shall we? In 1929, Lansky married Anna Citrone, and together they had three children. The couple's children were named Paul Lansky, Bernard Lansky, who would also later come to be known as Buddy, and lastly they had a daughter whose name was Sandra. Sandra would later on marry and would take on the name Lombardo, which means that she married an Italian. Sandra, the youngest child, wrote a book in 2014 named Daughter of the King, Growing Up in Gangland. Her memoir retells what it was like to be raised by a man who was both a father figure and a prominent figure in the criminal underworld. Lansky's marriage with Anna was not a happy one. Anna was not a fan of his criminal dealings, and in 1947, their marriage came to an end. In 1948, Lansky married Thelma Schwartz, and this time he got it right. Thelma was obviously somebody that was willing to look past Lansky's criminal activities, and she remained by his side, and they stayed together until the very end. His grandson, Meyer Lansky II, was featured in a 2015 docudrama that explored the formation of the Mafia. He even had a Vegas casino, which has a restaurant, the Bugs and Myers Steakhouse at the Flamingo, where you can experience an authentic Vegas mob wedding. Meyer Lansky II is all over the place, like, oh look, I didn't choose to go into the mafia, I chose a different path, a better path. But like literally, this guy's entire personality is based off the fact that his grandfather was Meyer Lansky. His Instagram is filled with pictures of his grandfather. It's filled with merch with his grandfather's name, exhibits in honor of his grandfather, and he even talks to all mafia guys about his grandfather. So like, no, you didn't go into the mafia. But what you do is rest on your grandfather's laurels and the fame that he built from his experience building the mafia that you are too good to be a part of. So I don't know. I just I hate that when kids and grandkids of mafia guys come out and they're like, oh, look at how good I'm doing. I didn't go into organized crime. And it's like, OK, but you're profiting off of your family member that did. So like, are you that much better? Like, really, are you? I don't know. I personally don't think so, but whatever, you know, that's just my opinion. Meyer Lansky, despite being a very respected man in the criminal world, he did not force his kids to follow in his footsteps. And I think that's pretty interesting because usually there's two completely different kind of guys. There's the, I'm going to build you from the minute that you take your first steps to lead a mafia family. You are going to eat, breathe, be mafia, and that is what you are going to do. And, you know, the second you can take a step, I'm putting a gun in your hand. You're going to be shooting people like I am training you from birth for this. And then there's the I will die before I let you go anywhere near the mafia. You will never be an organized crime. You will never commit a crime. I will die first. Lansky allowing his children to make their own path and make that choice on their own, whether they want to go in the mafia or not. It's pretty interesting to see because it's usually not like that. The Mafia was a respectable profession among the Sicilians. Joseph Bonanno always said that a mafioso was a man of honor, but it wasn't so honorable for Jewish guys like Meyer Lansky. They didn't really look at it as favorable or honorable. They looked at it as criminal. Despite having spent his entire life in the organization, Lansky actually 
kind of thought it was disgraceful. He still desired a different life for his kids. So as much as his relatives will say like, oh, he left the choice to us if we wanted to go into organized crime or not, maybe he did lean more towards the I will die before I see you follow in my footsteps than the kids led on or that he led on to the kids. One of his sons, Paul, would eventually enroll in the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Senator Kefauver of Tennessee wrote that the Lansky boy has justified the confidence with which was placed upon him. Upon appointing Paul Lansky to West Point, in 1954, Paul Lansky received his academy diploma and enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. That same senator had a much different tone when he was talking about the older Lansky. When the trials that he put together, the Kefauver Committee Trials, questioned Lansky and his associates, most of the information discussed was about Lansky and his buddies Bugsy Siegel, Mo Sedaway, and Benny Binion. They stated how the Nevada Tax Commission didn't care if you were a known criminal like these guys. They would still hand out gambling licenses. They also questioned them about Saratoga area gambling casinos in New York about slot machines, craps games, horse race gambling, coin-operated vending rackets, and bookmaking wire services. Albert and Anthony Anastasia, Gerardo Catina, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis, Frank Erickson, Virginia Hill, Michael Lasari, Willie and Salvatore Moretti, and Joe Perfacci were all questioned alongside Lansky. And this questioning all went down in July, August, October, and December of 1950, and February and March of 1951. Virginia Hill was extensively questioned about her relationship with Bugsy Siegel and the involvement of men like Joe Adonis, Joe Fischetti, Frank Costello, and Meyer Lansky in his untimely death. Virginia Hill was one of two people, the other being Frank Costello, who came out a household name after the Kefauver trials. And the questioning about Bugsy Siegel was probably the thing that they spent the most time asking her about. Anyway, back to Lansky's kid. Paul Lansky served in the U.S. Air Force until 1963, when he decided to leave the service with the rank of captain in order to accept a position as a civil engineer in Tacoma, Washington. He even went so far as to pretend that he and his father had some sort of falling out and that they didn't speak, making it clear that he stayed far away from his father's line of work. Lansky also had two brothers that he did a lot of criminal racketeering with. His brother, Jack Lansky, was a longtime partner of his, running hotels in Las Vegas and Cuba. And another brother, Jack, put up $197,000 of his own money to get the Thunderbird Hotel up and running in Las Vegas. During World War II, the whole landscape of the world was just completely wild, especially for somebody of Jewish descent. The German-American Bund organized rallies in the 1930s, and Lansky and his gang went above and beyond their typical illegal actions to disperse them. Pretty much the whole point of the German-American Bund was just to back the Nazis. Like, they wanted to bring Nazis to America. They held pro-Nazi rallies, and anytime there was a German neighborhood, you could find people with the signs and the symbols and just doing everything that they were doing over in Germany, trying to bring that message here to America. And Lansky and his boys were not down for it. He would go in with bats and him and his boys dispersed every crowd that they heard about. And they had no qualms doing it. Lansky also played a very significant role in Operation Underworld, an effort by the Office of Naval Intelligence, or the ONI, to enlist criminals to keep an eye out for German spies and submarine-borne saboteurs during World War II. Through a senior U.S. Navy official, Lansky assisted in brokering a deal with the government in exchange for mafia protection for the warships that were being built on the piers of the New York Harbor and making sure that no protests or rallies or anything broke out on the piers. This bargain secured Luciano's release from prison because he had previously been given a 30 to 50 year jail sentence and nobody wanted that. 
there was a lot of concern of an attack or an act of sabotage by Nazi sympathizers since German submarines were sinking Allied ships in large numbers along the eastern shoreline and the Caribbean coast. Lansky established a connection between the ONI and Luciano, who is said to have given Joseph Lanza an order to stop sabotage on the New York Harbor. Meyer Lansky, in 1946, participated in a covert conference in Havana to review Siegel's management of the Flamingo Hotel, which was causing Siegel's mafia backers to lose a lot of money and was running significantly behind schedule. Lansky pleaded with the other bosses to save his friend Siegel, even though everybody wanted to kill him. Despite being given a break after this meeting, Siegel kept losing money on the Flamingo. Then a second meeting was scheduled. This meeting took place after the casino made a tiny profit, but not what they were expecting. Lansky persuaded the other investors to grant Siegel more and more chances with Luciano's assistance. The other investors decided once and for all that Siegel was done when the hotel started losing money yet again. It's commonly accepted that because of his longstanding friendship with Siegel and his position inside the company, Lansky kind of felt forced to provide the go-ahead for his termination. During a shooting in Beverly Hills, California on June 20th, 1947, Siegel was killed. Gus Greenbaum and Mo Sedway were among the Lansky allies that entered the Flamingo and assumed control of the hotel 20 minutes after Siegel was shot and killed. The Flamingo was nonetheless owned by Lansky for the following 20 years, according to the FBI. Later in life, Lansky claimed Ben Siegel would be alive today if it had been up to him, and he said that in a number of interviews. With Siegel's passing, control of Vegas shifted from the New York Five families to the Chicago outfit. Lansky is thought to have counseled and assisted Chicago Chief Tony Accardo, who, yes, I have done a video on, so if you want to watch a Tony Accardo episode, I have done it. I'll link it in the description. In the beginning stages of establishing his grasp, despite the fact that his involvement was significantly more constrained than in prior years. Luciano's pandering sentence was converted to time served after World War II and his assistance in winning World War II for America. The condition for Luciano's release was that he had to immediately vacate the U.S. and was never allowed to return, and they immediately sent him home to his home country of Italy. He arrived in Italy to cheers and jeers, but that is just not where he wanted to be. He was famous as soon as he hit the sand in Italy, but he wanted no part of being in Italy. Luciano wanted to be in the U.S. with all his friends and the mafia that he built, so he headed for Cuba to try to regain command of the mafia. With the approval of the dictator of Cuba, Fulgencio Batista, Luciano took control of and managed a number of casinos in Cuba. In October of 1946, Luciano secretly moved to Havana, Cuba to be closer to the U.S. so that he could stay involved in the American mafia operations, and eventually he hoped to return home. Lansky was already established in Cuba by this point, and he had the ability to congregate people to meet with Luciano there, so they already had a network going at this point. On December 22nd, 1946, in the Hotel Nacional, the Havana Conference took place. Since the Chicago meeting in 1932, there had not been a formal gathering of American underworld figures, and this was the first. Joe Adonis... Albert, the Mad Hatter, Anastasia, Frank Costello, Joseph, Joe Bananas, Banano, Vito Genovese, Mo Dalitz, and Thomas Lucchese, all from New York, were in attendance, as well as Santo Traficante Jr. from Tampa, Carlos Marcello from New Orleans, and Stefano Magadino, Banano's cousin and the leader of the Buffalo crime family. Tony Accardo, the trigger-happy Charlie and Rocco Fischetti brothers from Chicago, as well as Lansky, Dalitz, and Dandy Phil Castile from Florida, were all there to advocate for the interests of the Jewish gangsters. Luciano was the first to arrive, having sneakily used a fake passport to enter Havana. For those who were prepared to invest the correct amount of money, Lansky's vision of a prosperous new Havana was presented to the audience. 
Until he could find a legal way to return to the United States, Lansky was chosen as the mob's kingpin, according to Luciano, the only participant to ever recall these events in any details. He was to rule Cuba during that period. Frank Sinatra, who traveled to Cuba with his friends, the Fischetti brothers, among others, entertained the attendees at the conference. Everybody that came had to give a reason for going to Cuba, and everybody that went said that they were going to see Frank Sinatra perform. But it was really just a big commission meeting that Luciano would be able to attend. They discussed three big topics, the heroin trade, Cuban gambling, and a hotel that Bugsy Siegel was currently failing at. Luciano was not secretive about being in Cuba. He would publicly go out and hang out with Frank Sinatra and be photographed doing it. He would visit a lot of nightclubs and attractions and be photographed doing it. But when the U.S. government learned that he was there, they threatened Cuba. They told Cuba that as long as Luciano was there, the U.S. would not send any narcotic prescription drugs. Two days later, the Cuban government detained him and put him on a Turkish freighter back to Italy. Another thing that was discussed at the Havana conference was what was going to be done about Bugsy Siegel. Bugsy, or Ben as his friends called him, was married to Virginia Hill. Virginia had been involved in the mafia a very long time and was known as the queen of the mob. The problem is there was about a million dollars worth of investments from organized crime members that everybody claims Virginia Hill and Bugsy Siegel had stolen, and this million dollars was nowhere to be found. So both Virginia Hill and Bugsy Siegel were a huge point of contention at this meeting. There was already a mafia influence in Cuba. Meyer Lansky had set up multiple casinos in Cuba that he owned with the president of Cuba, Fulgencio Batista y Salvador. And there was an enormous drug trade going on between America and Cuba through the Florida and New Orleans family use of shrimp boats and Teamsters trucks to transport the drugs. Cuba was also a middle point for other transports. So if you were trying to go from like, let's say France, the French connection, Cuba was a stop along that. If you were trying to go from Italy, it was just easier to stop in Cuba. So there was already a huge drug trade going on there. The Havana Conference was the place of one of the biggest announcements in Mafia history. Luciano announced that he had eliminated the position of Capu di Tutti Capi, or Boss of Bosses, after Salvatore Maranzano held the position and was killed by Luciano himself. Luciano also killed the prior Capu di Tutti Capi, Masseria. This is also where the Mafia Commission was announced and the framework was laid out for the group of bosses of each of the families to be a ruling body that settled disputes. So the entire Mafia Commission was created here at the Havana Conference. A lot of things were discussed at the Havana Conference and it was one of the most influential and important meetings in Mafia history. The commission, the American Mafia's narcotics trade, and the situation with Bugsy Siegel were all ironed out and fully figured out by the ending of this meeting. At this point, it was clear that Vito Genovese was an enemy and was making a power play against Luciano and or Frank Costello. He wanted to take over the family, and as Anastasia seconded Luciano's bid for power, he also became an enemy. The American government caught wind that all these powerful mafia figures were in Havana for a conference, and they found out that Luciano was also attending, and they got pissed. The whole point of deporting Luciano was to get him away from America and out of America's affairs, and there he is, a stone throw away and still calling the shots with the American crime syndicate. Since America has and had absolutely no power in Cuba, they did the next best thing. When they found out that Luciano was in Cuba and consorting with the American mafia there, they told Cuba, like, hey, we will never send you a narcotic prescription drug again. And Cuba relied heavily on American medications, so they had no choice but to immediately throw Luciano on the boat and get him out of Cuba. America was just looking to be an asshole, though. They imposed sanctions and embargoes on Cuba in the 1960s that severely impacted ordinary Cuban citizens' ability to access medications that they needed. I talk a lot about Cuba, their decision to kick out Luciano, and the implications of a future embargo from the U.S., 
and what that did to the Cuban economy in my video about Joe Adonis. So if you're interested in that, it's really interesting to hear about the impacts that the U.S. had on Cuba and the hostile relationships that all started with Luciano hiding out there. So I'll link that video in the description as well. Batista and Lansky formed a renowned friendship and business relationship, and that lasted for a decade. During a stay at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York in the late 1940s, it was mutually agreed upon that in exchange for kickbacks, Batista would offer Lansky and the Mafia control of the entire country's casinos and racetracks. Through a succession of puppet presidents, he held control until 1940 when he won the presidency on a populist platform. After that, he put into effect Cuba's 1940 constitution and ruled until 1944. After that, Batista's oppressive regime started to consistently profit from the exploitation of Cuba's business interests by negotiating lucrative deals with the American mafia, which controlled the drug, gambling, and prostitution industries in Havana, as well as with the large U.S.-based multinational corporations that were engaged in business in Cuba. He relocated to Florida after his term was up, before going back to Cuba to run for president in 1952. He staged a military coup against President Carlos Pro Sacaros to prevent the election because he was certain to lose that election. So he just, you know, staged a military coup, no big deal. Batista suspended the 1940 constitution that he had created and put in place and repealed a majority of political liberties, including the right to strike. And he received financial, military, and logistical help from the United States government to do so. After that, he formed an alliance with the richest landowners in Cuba, who also owned the biggest sugar plantations and oversaw a stagnant economy that increased the gap between the wealthy and the poor in Cuba. Over time, it got to the point where 70% of the fertile land was held by foreigners and the United States controlled a majority of the sugar business. In order for Batista to retake power, Lansky offered then-President Carlos Pro Sacaros a $250,000 bribe in 1952. Pretty much like, hey, there's a military coup against you, you're about to lose. Take this 250 and jet the fuck out. Go away. Following a military takeover of the government in March of 1952, Batista rapidly restored gambling because gambling had been outlawed by Sakharas. Lansky accepted Batista's offer to work as an unofficial gaming minister in exchange for a $25,000 annual pay. In 1955, he altered the gambling regulations once further, allowing anybody that invested a million dollars in a hotel or $200,000 in a brand new nightclub to obtain a gaming license, which is a lot different than here in America. It's very hard to get a gaming or a gambling license here in America. So there, you don't go through background checks. You don't go through anything other than investing a million dollars. This clause exempted venture capitalists from background checks, unlike the process for obtaining gambling licenses in Las Vegas, which was a lot harder. They were given state matching money for construction, a 10-year tax exemption, and duty-free importation of furniture and equipment as long as they made the necessary investment. So pretty much, you put a million dollars into a hotel, do whatever the fuck you want. In addition to receiving $250,000 for the license, the government would also receive a share of the revenue from each casino. Roberto Fernandez E. Miranda, the brother of Batista's wife, Marta Fernandez Miranda de Batista was to be in charge of Cuba's 10,000 slot machines, including those that gave out small prizes to children at county fairs. Materials for building hotels were exempt from import duties, and Cuban contractors with the right in made a killing by importing a lot more than was required and selling them for a lot more than they bought it for. So in other words, they're importing all of this cheap material, they're not paying import taxes the way that everybody else is, and they're able to sell it for the same price that everybody else is, even though they paid a whole lot less because they didn't have to pay the taxes or anything else on importing the items. And they made a lot of money. The Cabaret Montmartre was transformed by Lansky, who soon made it the place to be in Havana. Additionally, Lansky added a casino to the Hotel Nacional with Batista's assistance. 
Batista tightened media censorship and used his secret police force, the Bureau for the Repression of Communist Activities, to carry out widespread acts of violence, torture, and public executions in an effort to quell the populace's growing discontent, which was later manifested through frequent student riots and demonstrations. As socialist ideologies gained more traction in 1957, these murders increased a lot. Estimates of the number of fatalities range from hundreds to nearly 20,000 people. Over the course of two years, so December of 1956 to December of 1958, Fidel Castro's 26th of July movement and other rebelling elements led to an urban and rural-based guerrilla uprising against Batista's government, which culminated in his ultimate defeat by rebels under the command of K. Guevara at the Battle of Santa Clara on New Year's Day in 1959. With a personal fortune collected, Batista promptly left the country for the Dominican Republic, where strongman and former military buddy Rafael Trulio was in charge. You can see this recreated in Godfather 2, where Batista announced to the New Year's Eve crowd that he was leaving the country. So you can literally see this all play out in Godfather 2. It seemed like a lifetime, but Lansky had only been in Cuba for six short years. He started the trend that turned Cuba into the ultimate destination for adults looking for debauchery. The U.S. government had no say. There were virtually no laws. Prostitution? Legal. Gambling? Legal. There was very little that was illegal, and it made it the perfect place for the mafia to build an empire. Tourists would come for a week and have a crazy time and then they would leave. The people that were living in Cuba were experiencing the worst times possible. For its own citizens, the Cuban government was seen as oppressive and as a torturous, cancerous organization. From the point of view of the Cubans, they were left in squalor with little to no money while rich tourists played all day just blocks away. They viewed their country and its resources as being plundered by foreign entities, mainly the United States. Once the public execution started, obviously in areas far away from tourist destinations, the U.S. government pulled support from Batista. When he fled the country, he took $300 million with him, effectively draining the entire government's treasury. So if what he had been doing with the mafia and illegal activity and public executions hadn't been bad enough, he bankrupted the country and left it for dead while he ran to the Dominican Republic. When Castro took control of Cuba, it took everybody by surprise. Nobody saw it coming, which means nobody had a chance to try to funnel their assets out and walk away with even some money. Lansky fled Cuba the day before the revolution, so he wasn't stuck there when it took place. But by that point, it was already too late to get any money out. They had no choice but to walk away, having lost every cent that they put into Cuba. Any buildings that they paid to have built, all the slot machines, the gambling tables, hotel beds, like couches, everything, literally everything was just gone in the blink of an eye. During the 1950s, Cuba underwent a period of political upheaval, culminating in the rise of Fidel Castro's revolutionary movement. As Castro's forces gained ground and eventually took control of the country, the landscape of Cuba's organized crime scene changed drastically. The once thriving casinos and lucrative enterprises were shut down, and Lansky, among other mobsters, faced substantial financial losses. With his investments in Cuba decimated, Lansky saw compensation for the financial setbacks that he had endured. He turned his attention to the United States government, invoking a sense of injustice and arguing that his losses were the result of political changes that were beyond his control. So he hits up the U.S. and he's like, hey, I just lost everything and it's all your fault. You need to pay me because I, I have nothing left. I put all my money into Cuba and you went and messed with them. And now I lost everything. Do something. So what does Lansky do? He calls up his boys. Obviously, after operating an entire country for as long as he had, which was known for its glamorous debauchery, you know the most important guys spent some time there. And Lansky made some phone calls to them, trying to appeal to them to try to help him recoup some of his losses. 
although he was involved in organized crime and everybody, I'm talking everybody, knew it, he still had an extremely strong reputation for his financial and strategic mastermind. And he hoped that that would help give weight to his argument for his right to compensation from the United States government. However, Lansky's quest for compensation was met with mixed responses. While some sympathized with his loss and viewed him as a victim of political circumstances, a lot of other people saw his endeavors as an attempt to profit from his criminal enterprises that never should have been legal in the first place. Ultimately, Lansky's efforts to secure compensation from the U.S. government, it didn't go anywhere. He did not get anything, not a dime. Despite his tenacity and strategic thinking, the challenges that he faced were formidable. The legality and ethics of compensating someone with ties to organized crime were contentious issues that drew attention from both proponents and opponents. According to legend, Lansky controlled sexually explicit photos of former FBI director J. Edgar Hoover and his longtime assistant Clyde Tolson. Author Anthony Summers cites numerous primary sources in his biography, Official and Confidential, The Secret Life of J. Edgar Hoover, to support his claims that Lansky used extortion to gain favor with judges, political officers, and politicians. It's more difficult to understand why Lansky was never pursued to conviction after the publication of FBI information on him unless he was able to dodge it with blackmail given the considerable monitoring and investigation that were revealed in these FBI documents, it doesn't make any sense that he never went to jail. The only thing that makes sense is he had some serious dirt on some serious people. After losing everything in Cuba, Lansky worked with the CIA on several attempts to assassinate Castro. While he was in Cuba, he worked with other gangsters, such as Frank Fiorini, to provide information to the FBI about the shit that was going on inside the country at the time. That's not really that surprising, considering the Mafia was involved in a lot of high-level government moves at the time. They helped the U.S. win World War II on many different fronts. Giancana helped the CIA plan the Bay of Pigs. There's been lots of instances of the government working with the Mafia to get shit done. And this isn't even like a wild conspiracy theory. A lot of gangsters have made these claims in court, under oath. Richard Kane, a former Cook County Sheriff's police chief investigator, went to court and, under oath, told the court about how the CIA had solicited Giancana's aid in developing a spy network inside Cuba a year before the 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion. Kane was supposedly appointed by Giancana to act as his liaison with Havana sources, as well as with Lansky on behalf of Giancana. Roselli testified in court that he had assisted the CIA in a plot to murder Fidel Castro and is therefore entitled to political asylum to avoid persecution in Italy when the U.S. was trying to have him deported. He requested Jack Anderson, a journalist, be subpoenaed to testify and confirm his story since Anderson had reported on these murder contracts on Castro from the CIA in 1971. Giancana repeatedly demanded consideration because of his role as an undercover agent for the CIA whenever he was arrested. Both claimed that they were recruited for three unsuccessful hits on Castro, twice by poison and once from the round of a rifle. Lansky is an iconic American figure. He is portrayed in a lot of American media. The Lee Straussberg character, Hyman Roth, in The Godfather Part Two that was put out in 1974, is modeled after Lansky. In fact, shortly after the 1974 film's premiere, Lansky called Stratzberg to compliment him on a superb performance. Stratzberg even received an Oscar nomination for the part. But he also said, you could have made me more sympathetic. Roth's claim that we're bigger than U.S. steel to Corleone was eerily similar to something that Lansky had remarked to his wife while watching a TV segment on the Mafia. Vincent Allo, a friend of Lansky's, served as the model for the role of Johnny Ola, Roth's right-hand man. Additionally, Bugsy Siegel is used to model the character of Mo Green, a friend of Roth's. The movie accurately depicts real-life events, such as how Lansky was refused the right to return to Israel and had to return to the U.S. to face criminal charges, but it made up information about how Roth tried to buy his way into Latin American dictatorships and what ultimately happened to him. In the 1983 movie Eureka, directed by Nicholas Roge and based on the life of Sir Harry Oakes, Joe Pesci plays Mayakovsky, 
a fictional character who wants to take his gambling business to the Bahamas. Mayakovsky is a character based on Meyer Lansky, and there's theories that Lansky was actually behind the murder of Oakes because he wouldn't allow gambling in the Bahama Islands that he owned. And that wouldn't be too far-fetched. The FBI reported that Lansky was part of a group that had purchased land on the Grand Bahama Island for the purpose of building a hotel and gambling casino. They also say that Lansky is extremely wealthy and has more points in the casinos in Las Vegas than anybody else. They say that he has a piece of virtually every casino in Vegas due to his early entry as the protection for the Jewish element who organized the gambling industry there. His interests in Vegas are listed as the Flamingo, the Desert Inn, and the Fremont Hotel. Now, does that sound like the kind of man that would be told no by Sir Harry Oakes and just take that lying down? He was just going to be like, oh, I like you don't want gambling in the Bahamas. So I'll just let that land that I own go to waste. My bad. Like, no, that is not Meyer Lansky. Let's be real. He probably did kill him. Lansky served as the inspiration for James Woods' character Maximilian Max Berkovics in Sergio Leone's 1984 film Once Upon a Time in America. Mark Rydell plays Lansky in Sidney Pollack's 1990 film Havana, starring Robert Redford. Lansky is a key character in the 1991 film Bugsy, a biography of Benjamin Siegel, and is played by Benjamin Kingsley who was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for his performance. Patrick Dempsey, a.k.a. McDreamy, plays him in the 1991 film Mobsters. Mendy Ripstein, a character in the 2002 film Undisputed, discloses that he worked for Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky is played by Dustin Hoffman in the 2005 film The Lost City, which is a dramatized portrayal of Lansky's role in Cuba. In the 2021 film Lansky, which is based on Lansky's biography, Harvey Keitel plays the aged mobster, while John Magaro plays him while he was younger. Lansky inspired the character of Michael Lasker, played by Brian Benben, in the 1981 NBC drama The Gangster Chronicles. Chicago actor Mark Grapey portrays Lansky in two episodes of the 1993 revival of The Untouchables. Richard Dreyfuss plays Lansky, Eric Roberts plays Benny Siegel, and Anthony LaPeglia plays Lucky Luciano in the 1999 made-for-TV film Lansky. Meyer Lansky is played by British actor Anatole Youssef in all five seasons of HBO's Boardwalk Empire. Patrick Fischler plays Meyer Lansky in the 2013 TNT series Mob City. He's played by Ian Bell in the 2015 AMC series The Making of the Mob, New York. Mike Burstein plays Lansky in Joseph Bologna's one-act drama Lansky, which premiered in 2009. He's a featured character in Stephen Hunter's Havana, Stephen J. Cannell's The Plan, Eddie McGrath's New York City Gangland, Stuart Slade's Ride of the Valkyries, John Roberts' Memoirs, Eric Desenhall's novel The Devil Himself, Dennis Lehane's World Gone By, and Harold Robbins' The Raiders. Meyer Lansky and his second wife Teddy on their 1949 honeymoon are featured in the book Organized Crime in Miami, as are photographers from Meyer's 80th birthday with his brother Jake and longtime partners Harry Nig Rosen Stromberg and Vincent Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo. Meyer's 2019 comic book fictionalizes One Last Caper by the old spry Lansky with a violent chase after a stolen cocaine shipment. It takes place in 1982 in Miami and the Florida Keys. In order to avoid facing federal tax evasion charges in the United States, Lansky emigrated to Israel in 1970. Jews could not be extradited at the time, and the law of return allows any Jew to legitimately emigrate to the state of Israel. The Israeli government reserved the right to exclude Jews with a criminal history from remaining in the nation permanently. Lansky was returned to the United States after two years in the country. With the help of the loan shark Vincent Fat Vinny Teresa's evidence, the federal authorities successfully prosecuted Lansky, but he was acquitted in 1974. Lansky retired to Miami. His last years were spent quietly at his home in Miami Beach, Florida. He died of lung cancer on January 15th, 1983 at age 80, leaving a widow and three children behind. 
On paper, Lansky is worth almost nothing. At the time, the FBI believed that he left over $300 million in hidden bank accounts, but they never found any money at all. This would be the equivalent of $696 million in 2021. Lansky's biographer, Robert Lacey, describes his financially strained circumstances in the last two decades of his life and his inability to pay for health care for his handicapped son, who eventually died in poverty. No proof existed, in Lacey's opinion, to sustain the notion that Lansky, as the brains, the secret mover, the inspirer, and controller of American organized crime, he claimed. He comes to the conclusion that Lansky's riches and influence had been greatly inflated based on the evidence, which included interviews with families living survivors. The author T.J. English was informed by the granddaughter of his second wife that Lansky left only $57,000 in cash at the time that he died. That would be equal to $132,000 in 2021, so not very much. In his later years, when questioned about what went wrong in Cuba, the mobster made no excuses. He said, I crapped out. Lansky said that he was barely getting by after losing all his money in Cuba. When Lansky was having issues with the IRS in the early 1970s, his daughter Sandra Lansky made a public admission in 2010 that her father had transferred almost $15 million to his brother's account. Honestly, it's unlikely that anybody will ever know the true market value of Meyer Lansky. Gary Rapoport, the grandson of Meyer Lansky, has been requesting compensation from Cuba for the expropriation of the Riviera Hotel that his grandpa built in Havana ever since relations between the two countries improved in 2015. In December of 2015, Rappaport said his family was owed $8 million in compensation for the hotel and the casino which his grandfather built. And the Cuban government seized this hotel and casino and are still to this day operating and profiting from. While it's a shell of its former self with threadbare rooms and an empty swimming pool, the hotel employees still refer to this place that they work as El Hotel de Meyerlansky. While he claims that his family is owed this money, he says that he never actually officially filed a claim or hired an attorney, but he was considering it once relations improved between the U.S. and Cuba. It's doubtful that the family will ever actually see a dime from Cuba, though, given that his grandfather is considered one of the major contributing factors to the revolution where Castro took over. As soon as peace talks started, the U.S. government made a claim for $1.9 billion, or $8 billion adjusting for inflation, in claims from the U.S. citizens and businesses that are owed from property owned and seized by Castro, while Cuba claims that it is owed over $120 billion dollars from the U.S. government after damages incurred from the embargo being in place for all that time. So the U.S. turns around and says like, hey, our citizens had land and businesses over there and you owe us $8 billion. And they're like, oh yeah, haha, that's funny. You caused $120 billion in damages with your little embargoes and your little sanctions. So uh, you pay us 120 and we'll cut you off 8 billion of that. And it looks like just a stalemate. Nobody's going to get anything. So that is all I have for Meyer Lansky. I was able to get it into only two episodes, which I'm super happy and proud of. Thanks so much for watching. Join me next week as I delve into the lives and legacies of some of the most fascinating and infamous gangsters in history. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow, comment, do all the things, and I'll see you next week. Bye.